So you then reach 2010, that general election, in a situation where a number of things happen. Uh, well, let's, let's go just one more step, one step further. Then you get the formation of the coalition government. Now, um, the, the, one of the interesting things about that coalition government, where I think that I think is relevant to this, uh, is that uh, it was founded in part, but partly obviously there was just a reaction against the long period of Labour government. So, you know, Cameron was the didn't win that election. He almost did. You know, Nick Clegg made the decision that he did. I can see both sides of that. Um, but what you ended up with was a, a government that had capitalised on a, a sense of public demand for change and something different, I think was attracted to the idea of coalition as a new way of doing things. That was very much a strong feeling in those days, that first, that autumn of, of 2010. Um, remember Clegg Mania? I mean, they get 40% in one poll after that. I mean, you know, it's just. Um, but that expressed something very, very profound. And then what they did, unfortunately, is they, 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 they took an appetite for renewal and they just expressed it as novelty, which is almost the same thing, but not quite. Um, and I think there was a great squandering of that appetite for renewal uh, in what was actually an interregnum. Uh, uh, and then there was a sort of a, 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 a continuation of more continuity to that with the, the, the forms and the styles of government that come before, and there are lots of reasons for that. Uh, on top of which, you have the fiscal policy, um, austerity, uh, and the fiscal consolidation, which meant, <coughs> broadly speaking, two things. One was that the people who had caused the financial crisis uh, weren't seen to pay the price of it, but rather the cost of that was offloaded onto the people who essentially use public services, because that's where the brunt of the, the uh, austerity budget were felt, um, which was, among other things, just not really very fair, um, but also stirred up a lot of anger and frustration. So just to now take a step back, what we have, is so we're now in sort of that coalition period, uh, and these are two important things. So you have, you have a situation where the party of the centre-left has to live with the crisis of, of free market capitalism. Uh, the, the party that has opposed them from the left has formed a coalition with the Conservative Party, uh, thereby hollowing out its base in all sorts of ways, which I'm sure in the movie will be familiar with. Um, uh, and the Conservative, at that, the government then responding to uh, what was essentially a crisis of a crisis of free market capitalism uh, by implementing austerity policy, uh, policies that were more likely than not to get the, to essentially make people angry and cross because it essentially you would be sending the bill to the users of public services. And on top of that you have within those political tribes, left and right, you then have two very, very important factions that each feel they are owed a swing of the pendulum. And then, you know, you traditionally have pendulum politics, you know what I mean by that, you have the left government, you get up with that lot, and someone else comes in, Labour Tory, Labour Tory, that's basically the story from the mid-1930s onwards, more or less, with periods of consensus. In the Labour Party, you have a radically left that has essentially been treated, you know, has been put in its kind of Jurassic Park, you know, enclosure, <laughs> uh, under Tony Blair, for years uh, and kept and sort of fed treats from time to time, not much, just because they were too so they did that to be honest. Um, it would save a lot of trouble, but you know, anyway, the, 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 um, uh, who then by the time you get to 2015, think, well, you've tried everything else, it's our turn. Uh, on top of which, there's a whole new generation of people coming through who are animated by socialism and you know, are ready to. Anyway, we know that story becomes Jeremy Corbyn, the leader of the Labour Party. Um, and on the right, you have a group of people who only accepted Cameron, David Cameron's modernisation project, because the idea was that he would essentially do for the Conservative Party what Tony Blair had done for the Labour Party in electoral terms. They weren't that interested in the modernising, what it actually meant. They weren't interested in hugging buddies or going to the Arctic. What they wanted was a majority like the one Tony Blair won in 1997. So they accepted centrism, very important word in this context. They accepted the move to the centre as a, as a deal that David Cameron was offering them. And everyone, there was a huge consensus at the time that that's exactly what the Tories had to do. 
by not getting a majority in 2010, David Cameron broke that deal. Now, whether they would have actually got the majority if they, they had been leader of the Conservative Party in 2010, well, we'll never know, right? But certainly, a lot of people in the Conservative Party <laughs> clearly thought that would have been the case. Um, they really didn't like Lib Dems being in cabinet. They didn't like uh, they, they really didn't like gay marriage, although a lot of them are reconciled to it now. And all sorts of things they hated about that. There weren't really very much to do with the European Union at all, actually. They definitely didn't like the European Union, but they never liked the European Union. But what you had was an equivalent sense that the pendulum is, is, is due to us. Um, it's our turn. On top of which, they felt insulted by Cameron because he was basically officer class, treated them like dirt. You know, he was an incredibly supercilious, arrogant man in private. Uh, uh, I counter that. It's, you know, it's, it wasn't hard to see why the sort of rank and file Tory MPs who thought that you couldn't bear the idea that some horrible Lib Dem was taking home a ministerial red box when they've been stuffing envelopes since 1968. Get why they how cross they were, and it's Cameron who just doesn't even remember their name and just walks past them and hands them an empty glass as he goes past. And then he called them loonies, fruitcakes, and fun racists, or I remember all of them, but those are the three things he called them and didn't like it. Um, uh, so you've got, at the Westminster level, uh, an enormous level of frustration. See, I'm doing that thing, I'm just talking, and I'm so I'll, I'll just talk about it. At the Westminster level, you've got this enormous, uh, uh, the, the sort of, a, a, a pincer <coughs> attack on the centre as believing in nothing uh, and a sort of arrogant, supercilious, doesn't really understand the grassroots, what people really believe. And then you've got, in the country, a lot of people who thought something was going to change in 2007 8, thought something was going to change in 2010, thought something was going to change in 2015, and what do they get? You know, it's just more of the same. Again, and you can't really tell the difference between any of them. And Clegg, Cameron, Edmund Van, or something, like PPE, it's all the bloody same. You know, and uh, we can see that it's not, and we can argue why it's not. And I could have told you what the difference between Ed Balls' and fiscal strategy and Claude and George Osborne's was, they were different, but not very different, really. Um, and you can understand why people can uh, so that combination uh, of a sort of Westminster pincer attack on the centre and ideas and frustration from the, you know, the country at the political centre as represented by Westminster was the thing that the Leave campaign so brilliantly capitalised on. With such, that it was just, it was genius. It was, they, did, they got it absolutely right. They understood exactly the things you needed to do. Donald Cummings, he was a great campaigner, I mean, he's a very nice man, but yeah, he, he, he got that. Um, absolutely right. Uh, and the moment you got that 2016 result, something very, very important happened because if you look back at Remain, the Remain side, the extraordinary thing is that we now think of Remainers. You think, well, so George Osborne's Remainer, David Cameron, uh, you know, the, the sort of Blair, right, Tony Blair, John Major, Nick Clegg, right? These are, that's all across what we would have thought of as the party spectrum. And it had been cast as this kind of ancien regime elite, uh, with no distinction between between parties. And what they had had in common was an understanding electorally, in terms of campaign strategy, of what the centre ground meant in politics. That was, you know, you don't want to be too far out to the left or too far to the right, essentially. Blair Cameron. That, 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 was, that was the understanding of what centrism was. And it was very hard, and none of them had practiced, they had, none of them had developed the rhetorical or intellectual muscles to say, what was the actual moral, principled reason why that is where politics should be? We understand tactically how, that you, would, how you win elections like that, but why is that better than any of the other stuff? Why is that better than Jeremy Corbyn's politics or Nigel Farage's politics? They've never they've forgotten how to even articulate that case. And then, which was sort of okay because it worked, and as soon as it loses, then it's got nothing. Because if it's not even a way of winning, then it's the most hollow proposition in politics. Uh, and you know, you, that then played out through 2017, 18, 19, the independent group, all of that period, which we all remember, so we'll probably still wake up in a night screaming. <laughs> um, yeah, and that's why, and our world actually will start talking about There's one more point I want to make to, to get us up to date, too, really. That, that's, how you could have this, this paradox, I think, of essentially a phony revolution that happened, which is that Brexit, it, it, it was a revolution, 
in, 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 the, in the profound sense that, well, obviously it turned everything upside down, so literally a revolution in that sense. Uh, it was revolutionary in the sense that there were no, clearly an awful lot of people who felt they hadn't been represented, they hadn't been listened to, they'd been patronised, and they got an opportunity to just sort of press the big red button, send a electric shock to everything. And when it then didn't happen in 2016, they then felt that they had democracy on their side, whereas those of us who were Remainers were too slow to appreciate, I think, that that is what the conversation had become. Because we were too busy saying, do you have any idea what a stupid idea this is? Um, which it was, but that's the problem. It can be both of those things at the same time. So you know, it, it can be a terrible idea to leave the European Union, and it can be an affront to the people who voted for it to tell them they can't have it. Uh, and it can also be simultaneously true that Brexit was a revolution, giving some, I don't want to say representation, but giving some expression to people who really, really badly want to change, and a massive fraud perpetrated against those people. And that's why I was just the last point. So that's why we've got Boris Johnson as the Prime Minister because he is. I mean, when you think about the word fraud, <laughs> well, the interesting thing about the word fraud is it is the, the person and the event, right? So he is a fraudulent character. Obviously, you know, if he, if he didn't sound like he does and didn't dress like he does, and he was just trying to sell you a car, it would be obvious. <laughs> <laughs> there's some. I mean, I don't want to get, get digress on deference and Britain's strange relationship with sort of roguish tops, but he gets away with a lot, lot because of the presentation. But anyway, uh, that aside, the, the character, the personality of Boris Johnson, what it did in 2019 was to act as this extraordinary kind of solvent on the complexity of the situation that we were in. And that the, uh, you know, you can argue about the, the role, how important his charisma was in 2019 as opposed to the fact that people just wanted to break something to be over with and they didn't want Jeremy Corbyn to be Prime Minister. I think those were actually bigger factors. But Boris Johnson is absolutely critical uh, and his campaign in 2019 was very effective in many ways, but chiefly because he was able, that 2019 was a, was a crossroads where essentially Britain had to choose between whether it was interested in, in unpicking the complexity of government which was a challenge of representative democracy to say we've got these conflicting interests, but we need to mediate between them. Parliament's the place you do that. You know, that's how that's what democracy essentially is. The reason you don't have wars in democracy is because you have find peaceful ways to, to organise your different conflicting interest groups. In my my new bill of houses, your hideous eyesore on green belt, and someone has to basically find a way to mediate that so we don't end up punching each other. That's democracy, that's representative democracy. Direct democracy is show of hands, who wants a new house, everyone sticks their hands up, rights going there. Some people go, oh, that's actually my garden, and you know, too late, we're the people, you can't have it. Um, and Boris Johnson, his personality, his character, was so exquisitely good uh, at overcoming that, that problem. And the problem is it's a fraud, because you can't govern. And you can't govern for the red wall seats and true, um, you know, Lewis and say, you just can't, because they're conflicting interests and someone has to mediate. Uh, you can't have a cake and eat it, uh, and that's why his government is failing. Uh, that's why the Tories don't ha have got an 80 seat majority and no agenda, uh, and that's not That's why we are where we are, basically. <laughs> <laughs> in the nutshell. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to. Uh, that's, that's a fantastically good question. So, in order to set the context for. <coughs> I'd like to both support this as and why we live within the UK. Um, would you say that, uh, that the, the sort of troubles we've had in this country have been replicated around the world? And if so, are, what are the common factors? Um, I think Berlusconi yeah. literally yeah. Well, that's an interesting one, isn't it? I mean, Berlusconi, I think, is, is a good place to start with, but just to remind us that it's, it's not you what's happened. I mean, he was. Uh, and also, that's the, you know, the, the crisis, should have been a crisis of the EU, but they've just sort of put Italy in this, you know. Um, uh, uh, okay, but uh, I think probably the easiest way to answer that, because I think there, there are, it's such a big question, is one, is, to, is, to, is probably to start by saying, what are the ways in which Brexit isn't like Donald Trump? No. Yeah, because it's so easy. So I'm going to stand up again to say that I can present it again. Because certainly you know, there were these monstrous twins, both born in 2016. Um, uh, you, know, it, it, you know, Farage was going over doing a sort of warm up act. There, there, was, there was 
campaign money and tactics. You know, clearly there was a, a sort of an umbilical connection. Uh, I don't want to say intellectually, but you know, like ideologically, <laughs> ideologically is what I'm looking for there, um, and organisationally. Now, I go in terms of the, the, the characters involved. That, yeah, so that, you know, um, and then there's the following question: Is in what ways Boris Johnson might Donald Trump? Uh, and that's a bit more complicated. Um, I think I, I'm torn on this because at one level, I think he's, you know, he actually he does have come from a sort of more Whiggish liberal British political tradition. Uh, he's, you know, I mean, Trump. So he's, he's basically a fascist. You know, there's no point in being too fussy about the terminology. Um, because, you know, and, and the only reason that's not a useful term is because it got debased in all of the preceding, you know, 60 years of people calling you know, crime wolf so often and calling everyone they like a fascist, you know, the, you know, the feminists were feminazis and vegetarians were, you know, yeah, vegetarians. <laughs> <laughs> so it just, you know, and, and, and the Nazis were the people that Indiana Jones fought, you know, it, was, it just became this kind of trivialised, randomised term of abuse. They meant when you've got a kind of an actual wolf. Um, <laughs> you know, so, uh, yeah, Andrew was also incompetent and he didn't have a militia already. I don't want to get down that road. But, yeah, whereas I think, you know, Boris Johnson, he's, he, he has a temperamental thing in common, there's a there's sort of narcissism. Um, but also, actually, uh, you know, when I'm being more down on Boris Johnson, which I am sometimes in print, as <coughs> those who read the column might occasionally find. Um, I think actually they have more in common in a way than, than, than people think because whereas Trump came through this sort of celeb American celebrity route, the, um, the Apprentice, and, uh, and had a kind of bombastic stadium demagoguery about him, and Boris Johnson doesn't have that. He was, you know, have I got news for you and after dinner speeches and, and that sort of stuff. But in a way, all that is is just the British or the English. Mm -hmm. upper middle class cultural version of the same thing. Yeah. It's just a slightly more insidious but you know, culturally specific variant actually. And so I'm, I'm I kind of blow hot and cold on that one. Um, you know, and then but then you can look at so they've got another two other I'll let you ask some questions second, but the other two crucial things to think of in this context are I mean look at France. You know, so there's uh, yeah, Le Pen, Zemmour. I was in France for two months in the this year. I watched the debates, you know, the whole of the political conversation being just Zemmour versus Le Pen, as if that was a frame of politics, and this is very healthy. Mm -hmm. um, uh, there, I think, actually, in a way, the analogy is better um, because, but it's also related to the Trump phenomenon. Here's a, a, a thing that, that's definitely common, and it's about basically a failure of the old structures of organised labour and left representation that gave uh, generations of non-university educated, mostly white, tilting male, working class people a sense of esteem in politics that a kind of service-based liberal model that would have won we got by the end of the, you know, the, the first decade of this century didn't really Satisfy, uh, and so you know whether it's sort of flyover states in the U.S. or Sunderland here, or you know the bits of France that you know, or, or northern France where they vote for Le Pen, um, or East Germany where they vote for Alternative for Deutschland. There's something going on there. Well, that's the same. That is definitely <coughs> a, a phenomenon. It's possible. Um, um, and then. So what else? But the other one other thing I just throw into the mix there. Well, Eastern Europe is more complicated than Orban because there's, there's a bit less rooms of civil society there. That's more complicated. Uh, so there's part of that for some things. Um, but we also have a weird electoral system, which is a bit like the American one that does weird things that you know that the continental European countries don't grapple with. So does that that kind of sum that up? And secondly, uh, focus on the regions or the constituent parts of the UK. Yeah, that's definitely, that's definitely, <laughs> I mean, that's the one thing, whenever I talk about yeah. politics, the only content, there's always a moment where I say, and this always comes up when people say, what's going to happen to Labour? Can Labour win? What's going to happen? And they always just go, Scotland, Scotland, Scotland. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Labour's never had a majority, a, a serious, well, they've never had a majority in Westminster without the Scottish seats, it's never. Um, and, you know, what's, I don't, 
go, go into you know, where we are with the independence debate now, but one thing that I think is interesting there to, to tease out is what happened to um, Scottish Labour in really it was started in 2010, but I think it was the it was the Holyrood election 2014 was the big one, I think. But I might be getting this wrong. But the, 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 the point at which you started to really see basically a red wall in Scotland completely collapse and go down um, was a very exact configuration of what happened with Brexit to the Labour Party. It was, it, well, that was really the same phenomenon. And it happened sooner because they had somewhere to go that wasn't Tory. So they didn't have to overcome that visceral where Nan would have would turn in her grave if she ever thought I was going to Tory. Um, uh, so and so that so, where, so that's not changing in a hurry. And what's interesting is whether the fact that it took longer to happen in Northern England and the Midlands means it's also shallower and it could turn back. Uh, and my sense of talking to uh, Tory MPs in those areas and councillors is not so much. It's quite like what happened in Scotland. It's flipped. It's quite profound realignment. Uh, whether that's downstream of Boris Johnson's personality that he's able to be discredited, that changes it. That's one of the really interesting open questions. Um, Wales, I don't know well enough. I wouldn't really actually want to judge that. It's, it's a, it's, I'm aware that's a bit of a blind spot in my understanding. Um, I think Labour have done very well through incumbency there. I think they got lucky at talking to the say, but incumbency through the pandemic was really stabilising for Labour in Wales. Um, but there are other reasons why Wales is <coughs> Scotland. Um, uh, and, well, you know, Northern Ireland. What to say? I mean, let's see what happens when Jim Payne and the Big tomorrow. But I, I think they'll be United Ireland before there's independent in Scotland, actually. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, first question, Alex, or possibly the question. Yeah, sorry, which one is that first? So, given the cost of. Sorry. <laughs> given the cost of living crisis and the repercussions of Brexit gradually becoming more apparent, what do you think is in store for us politically in the future? Um, well, that's the next hour gone. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, it's good. It, 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 it's really I, mean, I think second. I'll deal with the sort of second clause first. I'll stand up here. Um, <laughs> I'm afraid I'm not persuaded that the uh, consequences of Brexit being identified as consequences of Brexit and therefore shifting the dial on that particular front is going to be a major feature in the next couple of years, other than the people who already feel that way. So it'll galvanise the, the vote. Um, I don't see a, a, a tremendous shift in opinion regarding the European Union um, on, you know, the, on leavers, unfortunately. <clears throat> But, but that will feed into the, the broader, that is one of the reasons why the you know, inflation is up and, and the economy won't recover as quickly as it ought to have done. I think the short answer to that question is to sort of reframe the question by saying, you know, Johnson is sort of broken now as a proposition for the reasons that I think I said before, that fraud has been a bit found out. Um, and then you've got this unprecedented cost of living, well not unprecedented, huge cost of living crisis, particularly inflation is not something a generation is used to, it does terrible, terrible things. Um, it just just makes people poorer and, and, and if interest rates go up, debt gets harder to service and there's some really ugly things coming down the track. So then the question is, incumbent government, shite the Prime Minister basically getting found out uh, economic pay, does that necessarily, it's another pendulum question, does that become the Labour Party's game? Uh, and I'm not sure it does. Uh, and what my, my biggest worry in this regard is that there's another eruption of the volcano to come that we don't know quite what it is yet. And remember, the Tories world got 9% in the European parliamentary elections of 2019. 9%. That was a broken, that was an existentially threatened party until they basically became the Brexit party and just swallowed that. Um, the it's a party allegiance representation all over the place in 2019 
I know we all feel a bit of frustration and anger. Now, is Keir Starmer capable of harnessing this huge amount of displaced energy that's about to slosh through the political system? Might seem all shaking their heads, and I agree. I don't think, I don't see him having the basic political capability, unfortunately, to do that. Therefore, where's he going to go? And that's my concern. That you know, why isn't Trump broken? Why has he got another run in 2024? Right. So where is all that anger and that energy, that volatility, going to go? Um, when you've got a Tory party that's given up on governing, has decided, you know, is, is, is now treating net zero as the new Euroscepticism. You know, there's all sorts of. So yeah, to cut long story short, that's where I think there's some volatility on the hard right yet to express itself in British politics, unfortunately. English politics. Russell King, could you ask your second question, please? The second question? Well, okay. both. Yeah. <laughs> well, though, the second one is... Oh, sorry. Okay. Um, there was one word that I was really surprised that you didn't mention in all of your brilliant speech, and that was the word migration or immigration. And I just wondered why you chose not to bring that up in the discussion. Yeah, it's a really good question. And I did deliberately not go there um, because um, it, it sort of, it would, the natural place for it to have gone would have been this offshoot of question of like, what was the legitimate grievance that people actually had? Because, you know, they were economically, they were angry, and they were, but that's not the only reason they were angry. They were angry culturally, uh, they felt patronised, and also a lot of people basically voted for the immigration. Question that was the dominant thing. Um, uh, and then there's a really interesting, it's a totally different conversation that's fascinating you could, you could get into, but would have been a rabbit hole, which is actually how legitimate is that grievance? If the place that you've always lived, you've grown up, where you've had your family changes and you feel it's a different country to the one you grew up in, but you never got to say, I want to move to a different country, and you feel in exile in your own land, is that racism or is that a legitimate political grievance? And the left doesn't really know how to address that without panicking and saying, well, maybe if we hose these people down with money, they won't be angry anymore. <laughs> and I don't think that works. So you need a different way of talking about it. Um, I do also think uh, that actually having taken back control of the borders, that is the only Brexit dividend that is real. It might not be a good idea. I mean, we might miss free movement, but it is an actual thing that Brexit actually allows you to do. And we do now have a very different migration policy as a result. You can access the market. So, um, and you see that now in the polling salience, it is going down. It will still get people trying to stir it up about the small boats, and that will get people angry. It'll come back up again inevitably when people do stir that pot. But actually, it's amazing how, how far that has fallen down, because actually, it kind of worked. Robert Grant, it's, it's just the way the questions fall, but it's all been meant so far. <laughs> Yeah. Um, how much hope do you have in the ability of any future government to make headway against the severe economic and social problems confronting the country? And if it can't, where does politics go next? Um, I think the, oh, the answer is how much hope do I have? Not a lot. Um, but someone there, there is a question coming about how can we hope we can be hopeful about? Um, do you know, what? I think there is an available space. Actually, I think um, a, 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 a patriot, a, a, if you had a charismatic, capable, articulate centre-left leader who was able to look in, stand in front of a camera and look like they enjoyed being there, which Keir doesn't, and look like you were, they had something they desperately wanted to share with you which he doesn't, who was able to basically say, look, look at the pandemic we just had, look at all those people standing on the doorstep every Thursday, clapping for the NHS. Why did they do that? They didn't do it, if they might have done it for people they knew, but they were doing it for complete strangers. Why? Because we're one country, because we understand solidarity, we understand solidarity through the NHS. What's the NHS? It's called, it's socialised healthcare. Why? Because everyone pays, everyone benefits. That's what social democracy is, that's what it builds, and that's why everyone, when they understand it, they can care about it, they can feel passionately about it, and they'll pay for it. Um, but you have to want to do it, you have to understand who it's for, and then you connect that to an idea about nation and nationality that isn't nationalism, but is patriotism. So you know what nationalists, they want to try and divide you. Actually, we're patriotic about everything that Britain represents, and it can be about the football team, it can be about the Beatles, it can be about you know, chicken tikka masala being our national meal, it can be however you want to articulate it. 
and that's a, 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 an unflinching, go back to this immigration point, an unflinching centre-left patriotic message about solidarity would be a majority position in this country if you had a leader who could articulate it properly. Who do you think could be that leader? Um, I'm afraid it's not Keir Starmer. I really wish it was. And I, and I'm so fed up with looking at leaders of the Labour Party kind of like squinting, holding lots of light, going, oh, maybe if you do it this way, it's like, you know when they've got it. No. Um, and when they don't. Um, is there anyone on that front bench? I'm quite impressed by where Street Singh. Actually, um, as you've got, I'm quite impressed by. Oh, there's another one that I've forgotten her name now. Uh, so that was more good to decide. Um, Andrew. Uh, no. <laughs> anyway, yeah, but yeah, I think they, there are some talent, but yeah, so but that's not, you know, in terms of the economics, um, yeah, I, 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 but without, because the challenge is basically a, a project of political solidarity to basically say we've got to. We've got to dig deep, or you've got to actually, you know. I mean, I, it's someone, so I can't remember, you know, someone says, you know, uh, compassion and conservatism is social democracy for slow learners. You know, at some stage, you've got to basically say, you know, all this anger and this frustration that you've got is, is you know, it's because you're not actually finding ways to give people realistic sense of opportunity and hope, uh, and that's a fiscal policy at heart, I think. It's, not, it's also cultural, I'll go back, take that back. Let's not go any further down that road. Uh, that way, my hope would be uh, there's the kind of Yoda, you know, there is another way. <laughs> my question, which I got your delivery question. <laughs> yeah, why do some particularly populist politicians, and Boris is the obvious one, but also people like Nicola Sturgeon, why do they never seem to suffer or take so long for poor delivery to kind of impact their popularity? Well, it's an interesting question. Okay, Sturgeon is a good example because there, that I agree with you. I think she is, the defiance of gravity is extraordinary. Yeah. Um, I think, but the way that's been achieved is by changing the, the, the question in the Scottish politics, which is not, and which is a, the, 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 an achievement of nationalism, and that's what nationalism always tries to do, and she's done very, very well. Well, actually, and Alex Salmon did a bit before her as well which is to say, with well, the question mostly, you know, in this country most of the time people are saying, what's good for me? And what they managed to do is to make the question you have in your mind, what's good for Scotland? And so if you're a unionist party, you're always on the defense of saying, well, I'm saying this is good, but you're good for Scotland, then why are you, why are you a Westminster party? Um, and that gets them a free pass, and also you can always play this game of saying, well, think of the things we could do if we weren't held back by Westminster. And that's sort of tarnishing a little bit. I think they've got, you know, got a whole second leg, second life, as it were, by being by from Remain because Scotland votes in Remain. So, and I think that's really, now that's already starting to wane a little bit. But I'm not going to call the end of SNP hegemony in Scotland, but early for that. But um, they still have gravity. It's just taking a really long time. Um, I mean, Johnson is an interesting one. We don't know yet. It's only been, you know, it's, it's only been a couple of years, and he's not looking great. So, you know, it's possible. Yeah, I mean, Mayor of London didn't have to do anything. That was silly. Yeah. Um, uh, he was, you know, he, he should, I mean, interestingly, T Theresa May, I mean, one of Theresa May's advisors told me she made him foreign secretary so that he would be exposed yes. as useless and yeah. he would have found out as it were. Um, but, you yeah, know, Prime Minister, there's nowhere to hide, and it's possible he's going to get to come up with something. I mean, you know, I was just saying before in the break, I mean, Donald Trump lost. And he lost basically because he balls up the pandemic. He could have won. You know, people were thinking it was very entirely reasonable to think he could have won a second term uh, at the beginning of, of that year. And actually, the reason he didn't is because he just actually governed so badly at the end of the day. And um, so, um, I think possibly failure to delivery does get them here. Um, but I, I agree, it's not doesn't happen fast enough. <laughs> um, but yeah, that is the undo. <laughs> We have two very similar questions from um, Susan Murray and Dorothy Smith. Which of you? Um, do we need a progressive alliance and a new proportional voting system so that many more people feel represented? Mm -hmm. Is that so? Shall I do it? Um, yes and yes. Um, <laughs> no, okay, so the, okay, the, the progressive alliance is an interesting one because, you know, there are. I don't like it shift my opinion on this a little bit, but I mean, broadly speaking, it, it, you know, in the absence of a, a proportional voting system, yes, clearly, it needs to have something like that needs 
that. Now there are technical legal reasons that people throw things up as, you know, as to why you can't do it. And it has been put to me that it can be counterproductive because then you know, what the Tories would really love to do is run a campaign saying, look, it's bloody people to vote all over again. These people are trying to steal your government away from you. They're trying to take your Brexit away from you and they're, they're ganging up. It's not democracy. You can see how they would run that campaign and you can see it may be working. Again, is that sort of downstream of the question of how, how worried are people about Keir Starmer being the Prime Minister? I think that's, a, that's an, a, an advantage we now have. He's not Jeremy Corbyn, he's not Ed Miliband, and I think he's, he's not the most charismatic person in the world, but ultimately, you, know, you can see people thinking, well, look, we just need to get the Tories out now, and he's the part of um, As long as the next one's stupid. Um, the, I think the biggest obstacle to a progressive alliance is ultimately the Labour Party not wanting to recognise that it doesn't get a turn. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, I understand why they feel that way, and I just frankly think they're going to get over it. Um, you know, but that's yeah, that happened. And in terms of the, the, the voting system, yeah, you, you know, it, 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 it's madness that what we have at the moment. And, and the particularly, uh, you know, well, first of all, the, the constituency link thing is red herring. I think you, know, you can have multi-member constituency, their CV is fine, we all yeah, yeah. this is real, I'm sure we know this stuff. Um, but also, um, you know, the, the claim was always that um, first past the post had all these like guardrails that stopped fringe parties getting in. Uh, and what we actually had instead is a situation where the main parties did, it become these kind of horrible dyspeptic things that swallowed fringe ideas and then kind of burped them out unhealthily <laughs> in government. And, you know, it's not, it, it, there's something so rock, I don't know the word is, but there's something so dysfunctional about having repressed coalition politics run through two <coughs> main English parties uh, that should be explicit coalition politics where you've got. A, you know, a Liberal Party, a Nationalist Party, a right centre right Conservative Party, a Second Liberal Party. Yes, Mo, do you want to put your question? Yes. I think we've all discovered it. Thank you. Would it not be better for democracy if the two big parties split to allow for votes to be better represented, voters, sorry, to be better represented, and for there to be dialogue through coalition? Uh, yes, and you have the need to change the voting system first. Mm -hmm. There's just no way that happens without you know the the, the scale of you know, the, the extent to which I mean I you know I, I look back on that 2016 to 2019 period, uh, you know, it was horrible. And I look back and I, on the various judgments I made and my instincts at the time of what I thought was going on, I can look back on what I wrote in that period, mostly with some satisfaction, and think, yeah, I think I've kind of I've caused some of that right, I understood what was going on. I think I will confidently say I massively underestimated was that the only bit of the British political constitutional arrangements that would be unbelievably resilient <coughs> was Labour Tory duopoly over the yeah. party system. That was the one thing I've got that done. I, I, hats off to them. That was, that was the bit that stayed there. You had to burn the whole thing down, and that's what's left standing. I mean, anyway, sorry. Eileen, where's Eileen? She's actually not here, but... Right, well, there's no question. Will there be a shift to PR? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, yes, I mean, why not? I mean, it's, there's a scenario, isn't there, where the Tories can't get rid of Boris Johnson, uh, and it gets a bit mid to late 90s, and... Yeah, it's not going to be 1997, but you know, it's Labour 301, Lib Dems 36. Ooh, hello. You know, what have you got here? And then, you know, then suddenly, okay, yeah, game on. And they're not going to be student enough to play the referendum this time. Michael Ryder. Hmm. Um, <clears throat> Does the notorious right-wing press in England drive the present disenchantment with the traditions of representative democracy? 
rather than respect it. Mm. Yeah, I, I again, I, I'm, I'm, my, I have an instinct always to become a journalist to sort of lead to the defence of the press, even though I find what gets some of the stuff that appears in the Mail and the Express and the Telegraph and, the, and sometimes in the Guardian just irritating and appalling. And I do think, you know, it hasn't come up yet, but, you know, it, with technology, social media, you know, Facebook is far more important than Daily Mail. Right? That's just a sort of a fact of where people get their information from. And television is still more important just about um, Facebook and social media. So the newspapers are actually quite low down the pecking order in terms of where people get their information. What they do still have is that capacity to short circuit the mainstream consumption of media by just getting onto the desk of whoever's asking questions in today's program. And whoever, so, you know, so, you know, the, not wanting to get to the rights and wrongs of whether or not against Garmin should have had a curry with 30 people in tier two lockdown conditions after the Holocaust by election. People are talking about that because it was on the front of the page of the Daily Mail every day. Too. And that's not because everyone read Daily Mail and started talking about it, it's because when you have a newspaper review, you know, then, you know, what then becomes a question that gets asked in GMB. So, um, you know. The counter argument there is that ultimately they want to please their readers and they can be slow on the uptake, but when you have social cultural change and they discover that actually their readers aren't as unpleasant as they think they are, they change. Um, but yes, it is, it's definitely, okay, I'll, I'll stop rambling, put it this way. It's definitely something that anyone who isn't, hasn't grown up in this country with our media culture finds weird, you know, that especially like and diplomats, you know, who I've worked with, people who come from other countries, European countries, America is so different, but they, they just think, what are these things you call newspapers? And we just say, for granted, that's what newspapers are like, it's not, <laughs> uh, or it should be, and what about size of, you know, kind of, um, so yeah. Ralph, I've um, released a question. Um, hello. Uh, the narrative account that you, the experts say earlier on of how we got here missed the potential impact of cultural value shift, how societal values have become more liberal over time, for example, same-sex marriage. To what extent is recent politics explained as a product of cultural backlash? Yeah, that's an interesting one, isn't it? I mean, there's certainly, um, yeah, that, it, it, it's very interesting, there's a correlation of, to me between that, you know, there's, or, put it this way, there's, there's a sort of a butterfly winged moment, what you can say, where actually we would not have left the European Union if it hadn't been for gay marriage, because actually the very peak of David Cameron's stress and anxiety around people defecting to UKIP uh, at council level and um, I think it was probably before Carswell had gone, but there was a lot of, do you remember that period in that, around 2013, 14, where they were Tories were really freaking out about the UK gobbling them up completely. What really stoked that up to the point where he had to make the speech promising the in-out referendum, which was the thing that Finn and Red Bean had to throw to his own party to try and quell that, was driven at that moment by the backlash against gay marriage, which was nothing to do with the European Union. He just gave him a reference to do the work. He didn't want to give them gay marriage. Uh, but he wants to cancel it. Um, so that's just sort of an aside on that. It's quite interesting how, and now, that it's actually it's, that it's not an issue at all anymore, really. Um, uh, yeah, and I think we're going to be lucky that we don't, we don't have American-style cultural wars yet. Uh, we're not there, certainly not there, mercifully, on abortion yet. We don't have the guns thing that they have. We don't have the healthcare <coughs> thing that they have. Uh, so I'm, I'm mindful that and we, a lot of us can be, have become obsessed with quite how messed up and divided American politics is. It scares me. It's becoming two completely separate nations, and they've got guns. So that 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 is a not a good situation. I don't. I just don't think that that is British policy. Um, what I, is definitely the case is that you know the most the age and level of education where you were in 2016, whether you've been to university and how old you were. 
were much stronger indicators of whether or not you were for or against Brexit than anything else. Um, uh, and that's a generational thing and it's a cultural values thing as well. Uh, you know, there's many different axes in which you could, could, could plot this. Um, small towns versus big cities. And you're familiar with the you know, question, so you know exactly what, what the, the different ways of, of, of dicing it are. Um, and yet, I don't know, I think it, it sort of comes down to this big this question we talked about with regard to immigration, which is, is it kind of the economy stupid that if wages haven't grown since 2010 uh, and people are angry and no actual policy even seems to make a difference, you get a lot of resentment and then you get some quite organised politicians who don't want to take the economic measures that would fix that but are very good at finding scapegoats for it. Then you get cultural wars and then you get the kind of resentment you're talking about, which means the resentment is a downstream of an economic kind of um, sort of obstacle that, that is stopping uh, progressive politics from succeeding. Um, or are, are, did sort of liberal values from the 60s into the 70s, turbocharged by 80s individualism, um, corrode a sense of community and social values uh, such that actually liberalism is responsible for the current crisis because you've got a kind of a combination of anything goes, social policy, totally selfish individualistic <laughs> consumer uh, economic policy, uh, and actually the thing that held us together unraveled. And that's the kind of conservative communitarian argument. And I think there is some truth in that as well. And I certainly think the only economic, you know, the sort of, if you could just unlock the sluices of distribution, you'd wash away the cultural anger. I'm not persuaded by that argument. Um, but nor would I underestimate the extent to which it is the economy stupid that, that has got us here more than those cultural issues. Did that make sense, actually? That was quite a Yeah, thank you. Mike Percy, your other question. <laughs> So in France, you talked about France, who saw the complete collapse of the traditional left and right wing parties to be replaced with one centrist party and, and fringe parties on the left and right. Could you see that as a possible scenario in the UK? And, and could you see the emergence of a sort of Macron type figure starting a new centrist organisation ever kind of working here? Um, well, you, um, you'll know the answer to that. Yes, <laughs> And, and cultural representation, but also you know, my, my, my father-in-law is you know, lives in France and we talk about the French politics a lot and his view on this is always don't try and understand French politics <laughs> uh, but no the, um, I would challenge one premise in the question which is that France doesn't really have a centrist party, it has Macron mm -hmm. because on March has not that's that the people, and we'll see what happens in parliamentary elections, but they yeah, but really, it's, it's not a grassroots organisation. Really but in the first, in the parliamentary elections after the first presidential, yeah, no, they, no, they, they, they swept and got a majority. And, and well, you, so we're very interested to see yeah. whether, whether, they, whether that can, can hold, it's true. Um, or what it, is, it, it, it means to have a centrist party that has vehicles for individuals. Um, you know, Sarkozy and Le Pen have been centrist parties for decades. Held together, you know, from you know, by the anyone but the pen uh, element you know, is important. So, I mean, so parking the, the electoral system problem, which is that you know, the, the, the new, you know, whether uh, that is that the proposition, uh, which is what is the macro proposition? Let's say. It's it's basically sort of charismatic technocracy, yeah. I suppose, for want of a better word. And as I said earlier in response to this gentleman's question, actually, I think yeah, I think there's a surprise. I think you know you would have there would be some people who would rail it against like crazy. Uh, and there is a problem with I think a section of the media uh, that would really get behind a, a Trumpian nationalist populist movement to try and stop it. But if under the right leadership, I think, yeah, you could have a, a, a centrist hegemony who could, at least for a period, we could get a lot of people behind that. I have two questions on Ukraine, which we'll take together. First, is that? Yeah. I read that you studied Russian and yeah. Eastern Europe. 
So where do you think the Ukraine war is going to take us? Is mm -hmm. it World War Three? Is it the EU splitting up? Is it... I don't know. Break up from Russia. Yeah, good question. Um, the second, um, the oh, second, yeah, second question. Yeah. Oh, the second question really is about war and peace. And it's concerning me quite a lot. And I don't know what the answer is. So, um, we've all been on peace rallies. We all believe in peace. And we all know that the arms industry needs war. And we also know that the arms industry wants perpetual war. No. So, so, what about Ukraine? So, should we, Europe and the UK, be sending arms, selling arms to the Ukraine when we know that we're killing innocent people and that Ukraine is going to be laid to waste? What do we have to do? Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll take that one first and come tell them. The question, the, the, one of the, the key premises of that question, which is, which seems to leave out the Russian aggression that is the reason why there's a war in Ukraine. Um, and also, not actually selling arms to Ukraine, but giving arms to Ukraine. Uh, and ultimately, but there's different ways of answering this. I mean, one way is to describe what I thought was going to happen in January of this year and what I got wrong. Having spent all the time in Eastern Europe and spent time in the Baltic states where there was a big question about whether they should join NATO, whether that would be provoking the Russian bear and all these arguments, and you know, I don't want to get sucked into that, but um, having been a big Russophile, having lived in Russia for a long time, studied the language, got lots of friends there, um, living in a small former Soviet Republic on Russia's borders, I came to a very different understanding of, separate from how much I love Russian culture and the language and the literature and all the rest of it, uh, what is the character of Russian foreign policy and how badly, uh, for various reasons, the 1990s failed to sort of de-Sovietize the ambitions of Russian foreign policy in a very profound way. Um, and that if the Baltic states hadn't joined NATO, they would now look like Belarus. Uh, and if they didn't have that protection, then I'm pretty sure Putin would have gone to Latvia before he went to Ukraine, it was easier. Um, and just going back to something we said earlier, I said earlier, about Trump and Cry Wolf, that's not even in the same room, the same scale of Wolf that we missed. Uh, and it, um, one of the things that you know we've all been guilty of to an extent is thinking, raising the bloody spectre of Munich and Chamberlain and his piece of paper for years as the emblem of uh, a failed policy and using appeasement also in this kind of trivializing way that underestimates the character of an international threat. And you know, from Georgia, from the Abkhazia intervention in 2008, you can see Putin systematically going through the 1930s playbook, going, oh, I'll take the Rhineland, oh, I'll leave the Sudetenland, you know, bit by bit, right? And you can see him getting to that, like, where's the page where he does, you know, the full tanks in? And then in January of this year, even then, I saw you know, building up the border of Ukraine, and I was thinking, yeah, because he's a rational game player and it's all about bluff and this, he won't do it. He'll maybe nibble the next bit, he'll do that, it's part of that game. I honestly didn't think he'd go all in, uh, and you know, why he did, I don't know. There's incredible reasons to think that something, his mentality has changed, that he's basically, you know, he's just a bit madder than he was in 2008 or 2013. There's all sorts of different things. It doesn't matter. Really, there is a, a, an excellent, you know, I agree with you on the piece of mind, an excellent reason to be skeptical about militarism and to find the arms industry appalling and to not want to think, you know, to have all sorts of cultural and social reasons to not want NATO to be the good guys in any situation. But right now, they are. You know, we are. And it's okay to say it because I don't like this government, I don't like Brexit, I don't like Boris Johnson. But those two things can both be true. And frankly, I'd send the arms to Ukraine. Because the alternative is there is no Ukraine. I mean, that man is annihilating, the, the ambition is to annihilate the existence of the nation of Ukraine, uh, and he will do it by removing the symbols, 
and by killing the people who are most vulnerable. So if we can stop him or try to stop him, I say we do it. Um, so that's. But what was, and then the first one was. How does it end? It was where. What will be where we go? Right. So, God, I'm oh, sure <laughs> the, um, I think essentially there is a. What is Vladimir Putin as we can understand it? What is the the gamble he has taken? I mean, he gambled, the first gamble he took was Ukraine to fold in seconds because they're basically all Russians and they're just, you know, well, they're, 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 they're all over. So he got that wrong. Um, so what's the next gamble? What's, what's plan B? And that is essentially, you know, there will not be sufficient Western solidarity to maintain the sanctions regime such as prevents me from, with the totalitarian control I have over my own country, winning a war of attrition. Um, uh, and, you know, especially if you then get to 2024 and you've got Donald Trump back in the White House, which is feasible, um, then you could basically cast it out. And, you know, essentially, you know, if after a while people will start to see here words like Mariupol and Odessa and Kiev and Rubiv, the way that we thought, you know, Sarajevo and, you know, with the Bosnian wars in the 19th. We'll sort of be aware of these horrible things going on, but it's, you know, yeah, we get it, it's horrible. And that, it all sort of goes that category. Um, I hope that isn't what happens. Um, uh, I hope that the, the other the scenario where actually, you know, the, the Russian economy the, the starts to suffer sufficiently that people around the Kremlin elite start to exert sufficient pressure that the policy changes. I, I, I think the likeliest scenario is not World War III. I don't think that'll happen um, for various reasons. Um, uh, I don't think there's no, I don't think the, the West will give the sufficient provocation. Um, and I do think there are enough people still in Russia who would, who would stop him uh, yeah, from start a nuclear war, but we've got to hope that. So, um, I think the likeliest scenario is finding a way to take sufficient damage out of Ukraine, territorial control of Ukraine, to say we have liberated Donetsk and Luhansk and these sorts of places, and that's a win, that's all we were aiming to do. You can gain the double thing that you can when you have totalitarian control of your media, um, and you go back to a slightly horrible status quo ante, but with everyone a lot angrier, uh, and more arms, and the Ukrainian state sort of hobbled in, in a sort of limbo, uh, which, and that sort of situation you can, I mean, look, how long was the, uh, yeah, how long was the Korean Peninsula been like? So that, I think, that's the, somewhere in there, I think, the likeliest stuff. But, and the, 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 the one just other thing I'd like to say, I mean, essentially, the, the key players here really are China and India, to the extent that um, Russia's total failure of economic reform um, in the last, particularly the last 10 years, where it's sort of become a nuclear armed petrol station on the side of Europe, um, and resenting that role, and therefore sort of lashing out strategically to try and aggrandize its position back to superpower status. You know, while still actually in that slightly belittled um, position, it leaves, you know, if, if, if actually Europe is serious about weaning itself off Russian gas, then what happens is it just becomes a nuclear armed petrol station servicing the Chinese company. Uh, I don't think Russians will like that very much. I think they'll like that even less, um, partly because of all sorts of reasons. Um, not least because there's a lot of people in Russia who like to think of themselves as Europeans. Uh, and they don't like Stephen, they won't want to think of themselves as um, basically just the sort of the gas attendants filling up Chinese cars <laughs> and the industry. Um, and then the swing voter in macro strategic terms is India. Um, I don't know about India, so I'm not going to vote. That, that's, where, that, that, that's where the conversation will go next. And there's another Russia related question which I shall read because it's unsigned. How significant do you think Russian money and influence were in the outcome of the referendum, Brexit referendum, and Donald Trump's victory? Um, 
Yeah, this frustrating thing, no, it's a short answer. <laughs> not, not enough, I think. not that it wouldn't have happened without, not that level, is my opinion. I think what, what it helps to, um, yeah, because just to the extent that we just know how much was spent, even if we don't know where it came from, um, and, and, and you know, what, thinking about breaks in particular, yeah, how long and deep the build-up of normalising a whole Eurosceptic narrative about, you know, Britain wanting emancipation from Brussels and all these things that we know about, the readiness, the rhetorical readiness, as it were, sort of softening up the British electorate to get a kind of a liberation theology of Brexit that then landed in 2016 uh, for the reasons that I sort of outlined in my talk earlier. I think though that's why it happened. I don't think it happened because you know, cunning Kremlin man with some money gave some, you know, had dinner with Aaron Banks. You know, I don't think that's why. But I do think we have been, lots of people have been tremendously naive about how early on uh, Russian security services and intelligence services understood the advantage of stirring up trouble just as a way of making any country uncomfortable. And this is, they started in Scotland before with Brexit, before Brexit. So, you know, the way I think of it, it's basically like fracking, you know, you have, you, if you basically pump water into the sort of shale sediment underground, then you can release all this gas that comes up, sort of combustible material. Um, it has to be there in the first place. So there has to be a, a, a sort of resentment in the bedrock that you're like, drilling into. But what, you know, whether it's just through you know, manipulating social media, bots, misinformation, the Clinton emails, whatever it is, um, the, uh, <coughs> If you know where to drill, you can you can do it, and it was a very deliberate strategy of just. Stir I mean, I'll, I'll tell you a story about this actually, and before I just make one more comment about the US. Um, I hated journalism in Russia. I mean, I liked heroic, brave Russian journalists. I hated being a journalist in Russia for all reasons, uh, not least because it became quite dangerous at certain point, and I'm a coward. Um, but uh, it just it was more just this awful feeling that. You know, you're just banging your head against the wall. They were you know, sort of post-truth culture long before it was even a concept here. Uh, but also just generally the, the what I call hyper-cynicism in the country at large. You know, people would say, if you said you were a journalist, they would sort of either presume that you were mad for even trying to get to the truth, or corrupt because you take money to write good things about certain people, because that's how it worked. Um, and you know, you say, oh, well, maybe that's how it works here. That's not how it works in the UK. Um, and you know, I tried to defend British democracy. I thought it was that much better. I still think it is, but there was just this moment I remember, and the conspiracy theories have no, absolutely no boundary between political analysis and conspiracy theory. It's not just all this sort of every, whatever you saw was happening or said was happening, uh, someone would pop up and say, "Oh, that's not what's really happening. Here's what's actually going on." And sometimes it would be true, sometimes it wasn't. And you'd say, you know, you'd be writing a story saying, "Oh, this minister's resigned," and someone going, "No, oh, you're so naive. That's not it. He's not, he's not the real one in charge. It's this one. This oligarch who's pulling the strings." And you go, "Oh, okay, so that oligarch's pulling the strings." And then you say, "No, no, it's not the oligarch who's pulling the strings. He's just up front with this interest." You know, and you just, you know, everywhere you just got deeper and deeper into the labyrinth down the stairs, new labyrinth. You never feel you get to the bottom of anything. And it was tedious, and I hated it by the end, and that's why I left. So I mean, it was fascinating as well, don't get me wrong. Um, and then there was a point, very clearly, I remember, like, walking down Victoria Street from Victoria Station, because I live in Brighton, got up to Victoria Station, walking down Victoria Street towards Westminster, fulminating my head about something to do with politics and Brexit, and just generally working myself up into a state, and probably be on Twitter. Um, and, and, <laughs> Just thinking, you know when you get that kind of that Proustian moment when it's like a familiar taste or a smell, and you think, oh, what's that? Something reminds me of childhood, like something's baking something, or there's something, or you think, what is it? And I just thought, British politics tastes Russian! That's what it means! That's that, that's what that taste is. You know, uh, and it's that. That's what they did, in a way. I don't think they did exactly all of that, but that's, it, that, that's the goal, and it definitely worked more than I think people give credit. Look, a couple more domestic politics, um, if people want to ask them, Judy. Yeah, um, uh, 
the latest bill to have gone through the policing bill, the elections bill, the board bill, the nationality of the bill, remind me very much of the sort of um, actions that Trump took and that the Republicans are still take, taking to try and quell the vote in America in various states. And um, it seems to me that the Conservatives do have an agenda which is anti democratic. Yeah, I certainly think that elections bill is, <coughs> is, is a nasty piece of legislation. In an insidious way, it's got some kind of plausible deniability written into it a bit. It's not, it's not full on gerrymandering, but it comes back to that point I was making about what's the difference between the, the sort of the, the Johnson model and the Trump model. And in a way, it's not that it's necessarily more moderate, it's that the way it's expressed is more understated in the British way. And it's not, that doesn't actually make it moderate, it just makes it, so do you know what I mean? I don't know if it's so, that there is something, um, look, the, the, are, are the Conservatives interested in legislating ways to make sure that you only get Conservative government for the foreseeable future? Yes, I think. Um, does this current Conservative Party under Boris Johnson uh, sort of sit around and think, how can we sort of dismantle British democracy because ultimately, I mean, sort of Victor Orban model, like liberalism is basically morally corrupt and they, you know, we're the, the heroic emblems of the glorious nation and we don't need democracy, no. Um, but it doesn't need to be that if you've got such a phenomenal sense of entitlement to be in power that you don't need to bother turning into my ideology. It's sort of, it's almost as if the sort of the, the jobs that the vanity plus the sort of entitlement of you know, the Reese Mogg Johnson type figure it, it actually is a kind of ideology, but just with this extra insidious thing that thinks because it's terribly British and British democracy is terribly old, it's immune to ideology. Ideology is something that sort of hot-blooded continentals have, but we don't have that, we're just British, we just always ignore that. So um, there, that, that's the sort of, the, there is an extra kind of coating of hypocrisy around it that I think is, is almost uniquely insidious. Um, it's not as aggressive as the Trump thing, as they want Republicans to do, and it's not as as sort of racial nationalistic as what Orban's done in Hungary. Does it belong to the same category of political manoeuvre? Definitely yes. Criminalising people who are taking leaky boats across the channel seems to me the same thing. Yeah, that I think that's more a slightly I see that's more sort of tactics than strategy. That's just a desperate kind of how do we just keep so we basically borrowed a bunch of boats off people in twenty nineteen. They don't like migrants. Uh, we haven't done anything else for them. If they keep pushing this button, we'll like keep going on. Yeah, it's not nice, but I don't think it's. Yeah, I, I, I wouldn't. I mean, part of that I just I wouldn't expect Chrissy Patel to come up with anything sophisticated. <laughs> <laughs> Russell Pig, could we have your first question? Um, okay, yeah, I hesitate to ask this question because it's a bit banal compared to all the big issues that you've been. Uh, talking about. There's it's always the best question. It's also a what if question, which is which is also quite deeply unfair. But in a sense, you you asked yourself a what if question of the type that I'm going to ask when you speculated about Keir Starmer and who might replace Keir Starmer and be more effective. So my question is kind of parallel to that, and, and it is, um, you know, what would have, how how would you have foreseen the unfolding of British politics had Jeremy Hunt beat Boris Johnson in the Conservative Party leadership election? It's such a hard question, isn't it? Because it wasn't close, you know. This is the, 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 the sheer sort of the momentum going behind making Boris Johnson leader at that point. Because one way to ask that would be is to think, what, what was the choice that the Conservative Party faced at that moment? And I don't you know, obviously in their heads, the choice was, um, uh, how you know, can we not have only nine percent of the vote, please? You know, who's going to get us out of the hole that we're in? So, so what was the choice they faced at that moment? Um, it was 
do you engage with the practical reality of what implementing Brexit involves? And essentially, do you, or another way of phrasing that is, do you define Brexit as the same thing that the European Union defines it as, that Remainers define it as, that the rest of the world sees it as, or do you define Brexit as something else, something that, a, a totally different construct that exists in the imaginations of the Conservative Party and the imaginations of a lot of people who voted for it? Now, that, that, that second thing is not, I'm not belittling that at all, because it's a really powerful, emotional, animating thing that totally changed the shape of British politics. So, in that sense, it's real in the same way that religion is real, people believe in it, it's powerful, it's strong, you can't say it doesn't exist, even if you're an atheist, because clearly it's a bit that happened. Uh, but it's not the same, that Brexit is not the actual Brexit. Um, and so the choice, that was the choice that the Conservative Party made between Jeremy Hunt and Boris Johnson. Uh, if they'd chosen Jeremy Hunt, they would have had, would have been choosing a Brexit you know, on those terms. And I think we would have been in a completely different place. Because then you would have, you know, at the most basic level, you would now be thinking, how do we implement the Northern Ireland Protocol? How do you tell the DUP that actually their interests are served by implementing the Northern Ireland Protocol? We're doing it the best way we can. You know? You'll be thinking, how do we rebuild diplomatic relationships with leaders in the European Union? You know, how, what, what is uh, what will strategic autonomy for the European Union look like, and what will the requirement for that be if Donald Trump is president in 2024, and Europe, in terms of security? and identity, and it has a political culture and tradition, can no longer consider the Atlantic Alliance to be something that, it, that, that strengthens it. Right. Which is literally the biggest question for Europe at the moment, in my opinion. They would be asking themselves that question, and they're not. <laughs> so uh, that, that is the best I can do. But the, the fact is, they didn't choose that, because they couldn't choose that, because to choose that would have been asking the question, why are we doing this in the first place? And then, you know, well, anyway, let's not, let's, let's not pick that scab. <laughs> <laughs> just ask a quick follow-up. Yeah. Just very quick. I mean, is Jeremy Hunt finished? Does he have a chance? I think he'll be in the cabinet of whoever replaces Boris Johnson. I don't think he will, he'll be in. Um, ben Wallace. Do you want to go up on my mind? Michael Fields has a significant question. Uh, is there a clear umbilical cord joining A, corrupt Russian tax haven and London city money funding, B, Brexit, with C, the consequential weakening of Europe, hence D, the Ukrainian war, and F, the possible breakup of the UK? <laughs> um, <laughs> I would say... Do you know what? I, not a causal one. I don't think that you can. I think it's, there's too many moving parts there. I just don't see how uh, how there, there's no there's there's no there's not enough agency in any one part of politics to actively link those things in a way to get an outcome. You can't arrange the Lego blocks that way. That's just not how politics works. There is a connection in that those are all consequences of a long preceding period of enormous complacency. Yeah. Uh, and so, you know, when it's sort of the Russian money, sort of London grads, you know, not thinking about what the Russian influence was in British politics and Brexit, as I talked about earlier, um, playing fast and loose with the union because you can basically score this point points and using it treating Northern Ireland politics in the most appalling way as a way to sort of make the uh, childish rhetorical arguments about England and Brussels that have no respect at all for Irish history, um, let alone Northern Ireland history. Um, the, the, that, the, the, the sort of a, 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 a parochialism and trivialisation of politics that made us vulnerable to all those things, yes, that's the connection. Um, but it's not one of those elaborate machines where a lever goes here and a ball falls down and the spoon flips over here and turns on. No, I don't think so. Another question from Ivy. Okay, come on in. 
I need to ask how long until the royal family becomes obsolete. <laughs> <laughs> it's always the obsolete. <laughs> Oh, you know what? I'm going to say something with slightly poor taste here. And I, I don't know how the camera I'm going. I'm not going to say it that way. I'm going to find another way to say it. <laughs> how can I articulate this if I get myself in trouble? I think, I think Just King Charles it. is a very difficult proposition. <laughs> you know, and I'm, I think for the time being, that's not an issue. <laughs> <laughs> And I think it will. I just think that that is, I, you know, if it goes straight to Wills and Kate, you, 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 you might think you know, it's getting interesting. I think there's so many reasons why I think King Charles will be interesting. Um, I mean, so, but it's a question, isn't it? I don't think it'll, 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 it'll change quickly. Um, but, yeah, I, 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 I just think none of us can really conceive of, of it's so hard, isn't it, to imagine how long you like. But uh, it will be, it'll be different, it'll feel different, and it will feel different quickly. That, by the way, is a trailer for the Headstrong Talk. <laughs> <laughs> when our former MP, Norman Baker, will speak on the question of whether the monarchy has a future. <laughs> we hear the ticket available downstairs, three pounds. <laughs> Uh, next Friday the 13th. <laughs> uh, <laughs> just happened that way. Okay, and Anne Simpson will now ask the last question of the evening. Anne? Sure. Oh, yeah. Well, it was shorter than the other questions and some, some, to some extent take, overtaken by what's already been said, but it was just what grounds do you see for hope, if any? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> okay, so first of all, here's how I see this, right? Um, at every stage, in history, if you were to place a bet on things being better uh, in the medium to long term future rather than worse, nearly always that bet wins. Right? So the it is true, almost as a as a fact of history and civilization that the trajectory is towards progress. And there are, there are two interesting ways of looking at it. Um, one is this a thought experiment, I can't remember the name of the guy who came up with it, but it talks about the 50 year newspaper. So if you read the news every day, or you look at your phone every two minutes, you get a lot of very bad news and you can get very depressed about this next one. If you can only publish a newspaper every 50 years, then the front page would be things like polio eradicated, Billions of people lived in our poverty. The war, even counting the Second World War and the First World War, far fewer people were killed in war in the last hundred years than previously and the World War, as a proportion of people alive at the time. So, the, you know, there are excellent reasons to think that, broadly speaking, things get better, people are much less like, okay, here's another thought experiment. If you could um, choose to be reincarnated at any point in any life in history, but you don't get to choose, you're just going to pop up somewhere, and you could be in a village in Africa, you could be in Slovenia, you could be in Britain, you could be anywhere, you could be a man, you could be a woman, you could be black, you could be white, but you don't know. Um, uh, so that's your total lottery on the outcome of what your life is going to be. What's the safest year to choose? Definitely now, without doubt. Because anywhere else, you, for a start, you might be unlikely, you might not well not survive childbirth, and certainly you might not survive the first five years, and then horrible diseases can get and you're almost certainly living in grinding poverty. Like that's easily the most likely outcome. Whereas now, like, you know, 
um, you've got way, way better chance. And so that is, you know, so that, 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 that's an important perspective. There's another one, which is coming back to the point about Russia and World War III, that you get very stressed and anxious about this. But I think about these, those boats crossing the channel. Right? Why are they coming here? Why are they? They're not going to Russia. No one's thinking, my God, I got out of you know, Syria, and I've seen those Russian guys, how they act. That's the place to go. No, clearly not. Um, because ultimately, it is true that you know, liberal democracy, even a dysfunctional one like ours, uh, and with a history and culture of tolerance and pluralism that allows us to be here as we are now, um, is not only the, the best, morally the best way to organize a society that any civilization has yet come up with, but actually also the most resilient. So, and I think that's why ultimately we will be okay. Uh, and there are two more additional, well, okay, so the, the pessimistic problem that I get to use the form. <laughs> <laughs> so here's the problem that we've got, right? As I see it. Stop me if you've seen this before, right? But basically, uh, let's just say, let's, let's take for granted that you have that progress is real. That's a thing that happens. And so here you have, so let's say that's time on the x-axis. And all right, so that's like, you know, terrible, everyone dying of disease is horrible. That's like everyone living happily and having a really great time and not dying in wars. And basically, you know, as Barack Obama said, you know, your art bends towards justice, but it zigs and it zags, right? Now, here's the problem that we've got. Right. So let's say, you know, like August 1914. Yeah. Um, let's say sort of 1936, 1937, 1990, whatever. Yeah. So then here you can zoom in, zoom into that. Um, and here, and it goes a little bit like that, you don't know. But that's, yeah, that could be like 1978, couldn't it? It was great. There's rubbish piling up in the streets. It's not like August 1914. It's 1978. Right. So the question is, are we sort of there, or are we there? Because on that bet of like everything's going to get better, if you put a bet in 1930 on everyone living longer, having happier lives, much better, Europe being at peace, having a wonderful time for 20 years' time, you'd have been right, because you would have been looking at 1950. So there's a bit of a problem about what happened in between. Um, so that's where I get nervous, because I just don't know how you know whether it's, you know, a bit of a 1963 Cuban Missile, 1962 Cuban Missile crisis, or a bit of an August 1950. Um, so I'm just going to stint back to something optimistic, and I can't remember what it was. Um, <laughs> But, but basically, everything's going to be all right. <laughs> <laughs> there, is, there is a way back, there is a way back. Yes, that was a die. This yeah. is going to die. Yeah. Um, so get, bringing it back to where we are in politics at the moment, look, the, uh, it was in, it was, I remember the place very clearly actually, it was, it was March, March 2018. And I was on the phone to a Russian friend of mine, uh, just after his birthday, and this was the time that um, uh, Vladimir Putin had just, I can't remember which bit of the electoral cycle he just gained, whether he just changed, he hadn't changed the constitution anyway, he just, it was just about the presidential election, and Putin was in for the third term, having come back after being prime minister for a bit. Um, and, I sort of hadn't really been paid too much attention. I was wrapped up in Brexit stuff, and I was on the phone to my friend Dima, and I was just sounding off about Brexit. And you know, my nightmare was a terrible idea, ridiculous, stupid, irritating. They have no, you have no idea what the disaster was going to be, messing everything up. You know, and, and how it describes how you know, people thought we had this perfectly sensible, rational country, and we woke up the next morning, and everything had basically gone turned upside down. We're going to use that language. Um, <laughs> And he interrupted me and he said, but Raph, you know, you just told me about these people who, who went to bed and woke up the next morning and they couldn't believe this smoldering crater where the country they cared about used to be. Uh, and yeah, I get that that's sad, but at least they got to go to bed not knowing what the result was going to be. 
<laughs> well, we can see how we can talk about is Boris Johnson going to get his come up or is this going to happen or you know, can they stitch it up you know, through the election? Maybe they can, but we can, we're having the conversation as if it's a real thing that they won't. And that's so important because I know I have friends in Russia who they think there's no point in having that conversation. Their conversation is, you know, what do I say to my work colleagues that is a normal thing that you say that won't give away the fact that I'm not with the regime? Yeah. That's the conversation. And no one in this room is going to go to the secret police for what I've just said. No. <laughs> um, the worst thing you can do is put it on Twitter and then I get no videos. Shout out. Not great, but even that, at least they're not literally attacking me in the street, they're just attacking me on the internet. That's progress of the kind. So, yeah, that, that's how I maintain optimism and hope. Thank <laughs> you.